Okay. Hey, team. Um, just here with a very good friend of mine and, of course, our guest for today. Welcome through to Pragmat NZ live broadcast. Today, we're going to be talking everything tourniquets. We have a very, very special guest with us. Uh, I think most of you know who I am. If you don't, I'm Managing Director of Pragmat NZ, the founder, uh, Simon Ritson. Um, we have a very special guest with us today. I'll let him introduce himself, however. So I'll hand across to you, Ed. Do you want to uh, let us know who you are and a little bit about yourself? Will do. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, so my name's Ed. Um, just retired uh, from the U.S. military. Uh, did 20 years um, over there. Um, started out in the infantry. Uh, got a got an infantry deployment over in Iraq in 0405 and then, uh, then moved over, got selected, assessed, and... Uh, was lucky enough to uh, become a, a Green Beret and Special Forces Medical Sergeant. And I did that for about the last 12 years of my career, um, four deployments um, on the Afghanistan side, um, operationally with that, um, where I got to, got to pick up a lot of good, good real world experience. Uh, luckily, none of it was, was you know, as bad as it could have been, but uh, did get, get to learn a lot of good stuff. And then later on in my career, got to uh, go uh, and, uh, Work as an instructor over at the, the Joint Special Operations Medical Training Center uh, from about 2013, 2016. Um, was able to do that working in the, the Trauma 3 uh, uh, portion of the, of the SOCOM course, Special Operations Combat Medic course. And then moved over uh, for the last portion of my career to uh, a portion of uh, the, the First Special Force Command that was, uh, was able to kind of start bringing um, prolonged field care methods forward into, into the force and things like that. So, Really got lucky to be uh, be around a lot of good, smart people and, uh, and learn a lot while I was there. Yeah, wow. Okay, so I I, I kind of um, I church things up a little bit to, uh, over the last few days or week or so uh, before we've obviously gone live here today. Um, and I think now that those of you who are watching and thank you very much for joining us, uh, those who are here, uh, I think you've got a pretty good idea of who we're dealing with. So um, welcome to uh, welcome to the Facebook Live. Um, we're going to just get straight into it pretty much. Um, obviously, just today's topic is going to be surrounding uh, tourniquets. Um, we're going to get right deep and dirty into it. And this is going to be applicable to uh, obviously civilian application in terms of industrial, not just that, but of course, uh, everyday carry as well. Uh, you know, I've been a massive advocate of uh, tourniquets being used and carried by everybody here in New Zealand um, since, well, essentially uh, coming home from Iraq myself as a, as a private contractor. Um, so, uh, and, and getting into the first aid game. Um, and also to the military community and to, to probably more actually particularly right now the policing community uh, here in New Zealand because to be honest uh, we've only just had these things issued here in NZ. Um, obviously uh, we're, we're a little bit off the pace with uh, you know um, especially the hemorrhage control side of the house and that's why we've just gone crazy with it here uh, Pragmat NZ and really brought it to the light. So first of all what we're going to do is we're going to start off right at the start and, and apologies to anybody out there who this may seem like it's sucking eggs a little bit but let's get into it. Let's talk about what a tourniquet actually is. So, Ed, I don't know, maybe maybe you could give us a bit of a heads up. Um, in your words, how would you uh, describe or, or what, what what is a tourniquet in English for the people who have never used one before? I mean, it's it's a pretty pretty simple simple idea, simple application, and it's literally just um, an item that you can can use in which to to fully occlude um, blood flow off of an extremity um, from a massive hemorrhage that has happened on on limbs, arms, legs, um, across a long bone, basically what we call the long bones, the the arms, the legs, the femur, the humerus, all those kinds of things. And uh, it basically uses mechanical advantage um, through the tightening of a windlass in order to, to gain that occlusion of whatever artery and or arteries are running along those long bones in order to stop bleeding. Yeah, so it's it's obviously a device which is used for extreme intervention. Uh, uh, tourniquets are not exactly a new thing, are they? I mean, um, we we uh, we've we've kind of heard about them over the years being a uh, thing which is you know uh, kind of come in, come out. You know, somebody said it was evil, then it's come back in as being no, nah, this is life saving. But now we have the evidence base from it. So I don't know um, when 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 did tourniquets kind of start? It was probably around this one, wasn't it? The uh, John Louis Petit screw type tourniquet. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this is kind of historically recorded the first kind of, I don't want to say mass produced, but the first one that was kind of widely used um, in the in the areas of, of surgery, um, mainly for amputations on the battlefield. This was 
this was in the the, the mid 1600s, early 1600s that this kind of kind of came about in the in the you know France Germany kind of regions of of Europe um, initially. Um, it was it kind of actually moved on with and without favor a lot um, all the way up until um, pretty much the the 19th, 1900s. Um, they used it in the American Civil War, um, things like that, and um, and it it really did you know kind of push the bounds in a lot of ways with what was possible thinking at the times. But again, as you said, it, you know, um, with a lot of the things that happened during war, especially at those times, um, a lot of, a lot of um, dislike unfavorability came about because of the turn, because of what was happening, myths and rumors and things like that, which, you know, we, we can get into. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely incredible, eh? And I, I mean, I, I could talk about this stuff for days in terms of uh, how things have come, how things have gone. Uh, I think the U.S. Civil War is a really, really fascinating time uh, in terms of uh, medical technology and whatnot. Um, you look at things like, for instance, wound packing gauze. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of techniques, including this tourniquet. We'll stay, we'll stay focused on that today. Um, you know, which which were employed, um, which later kind of fell off in sign, and then have come back um, with with the um, help of the evidence based medicine. And that's, of course, you know, just become uh, will come, you know, leaps and strides over the last, you know, 15, 20 odd years plus. So, yeah, no, that's 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 absolutely fantastic. So um, when it comes to, um, you know, occluding the actual limb itself for the for the people out there who have absolutely no uh, understanding of what, uh, you know, tourniquet is or maybe have, you know, been told that these are bad things. Um, obviously, a tourniquet is used when you need to keep blood in circulation. So the occlusion means that we're completely or compressing um, the the muscle of uh, of the limbs to a point where we've completely restricted any blood flow both in and out and that's something which is very very important to understand um, you know from a proper application perspective as well uh, due to the nature of where arteries uh, do lie uh, typically within uh, the muscle tissue as well so we'll get into that a little bit later on um, what I want to kind of go on to now um, is look a little bit more kind of at the myths and the rumors and we're going to dive a little bit deeper uh, into also the uh, I believe it's the Eastridge study uh, that you've gone ahead and reference here as well um, so yeah let's have a look at the evidence-based medicine um, do you want to take us through a little bit of that Ed? Yeah yeah definitely um, so so it's, it's kind of funny historically the myths and rumors of, of you know we talked about just just a minute ago the um, that it kind of goes in favor falls uh, falls out of favor comes back in favor and and kind of the one of the biggest you know, myths that started um, was, as you talked about, and in, in, during the American Civil War, uh, kind of an interesting, kind of interesting time to study about it because they actually, the, the Union Army, actually both armies, but the Union Army mainly started adopting tourniquets for all during that war, um, kind, of, kind of interesting. And um, they started doing this early on in the war, but um, they also started because of delayed evac times um, in which an, evac, an evacuation off the battlefield, even though these were, you know, not distant, you know, distantly drawn out battles or anything like that, Eva evacuation for these guys could still take a day, two, three days sometimes. And there are, there are actually um, written reports by, by Union surgeons that talked about the fact that um, there were soldiers that were brought into to their clinics and they'd have gangrene on their wounds and they'd have these wounds, these, these you know, limbs that they would have to, have to amputate due to the fact that they'd been sitting out in the field for a day before any of the litter bearers or just even the, the grave the guys that were digging the graves and going through and and uh, doing the post mortem services and things like that and collection for for the for the dead were uh, could get them back to a um, to the surgeon's uh, you know office there the surgeon's clinic and so do so you have these 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 large amounts of stories that are talking about you know oh these tourniquets are causing you know us to have to amputate we're losing limbs the second you put on a tourniquet you know the patient can die all these kinds of things and it kind of and it's kind of crazy, but it, it did. It stuck through all the way. World War One. We saw um, where we had the first kind of point in history in which there were actual medics on the battlefield. But still, because of delayed evac times, um, soldiers were being brought back in, and these they were having to lose these limbs because of these tourniquets that were put on. Ironically enough, none of the dead soldiers that you know possibly bled out from a limb exsanguination were ever brought back alive because they died on the battlefield. So there was never any really, any really good evidence, evidence-based medicine and, and tracking there to, to know, you know, how, how, uh, or if a tourniquet would have saved their lives. And then that kind of thing kind of, you know, moves on, moves on through history until basically 
Um, even through Vietnam, you know, these soldiers are told that these new great green field dressings that they have will stop bleeding the second you put it on and all these kinds of things. And, and, you, and you have these, these studies and especially like Vietnam, Vietnam was kind of the first one in which studies were really done. And um, they, they had about a, the, the U.S. Army 7.4 to 7.8 percent um, of the patients that, um, that were preventable deaths were from um, ex massive extremity hemorrhage that could have been amenable to a tourniquet. So, so you kind of kind of see that in the Vietnam area, and it's kind of kind of weird because once we moved into 2001, 2002, 2004, and everything like that, in which the U.S. Army still was not, you know, readily um, using tourniquets uh, in a in a mass-produced fashion. Um, we were still teaching the um, the uh, the techniques with using a field dressing and all those kinds of things, and the the preventable death from exsanguination from a limb was still 7.5, 7.6%. And that's actually one of the studies, the, the Kelly study that kind of started got, getting the balls rolling on, on the fact that, that, you know, tourniquets widely used would, would be a, a good thing to have and widely used and widely trained among, among the service members. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a, it's a really interesting thing. Um, when, when you have a look at throughout history uh, in terms of the conflicts and so on, you see uh, during conflicts, things come, things go uh, as, as you know, they do. But during peacetime, you know, people start to forget things. And it's, it's very interesting talking to uh, friends of mine who are still current serving and so on. And, and they kind of uh, have brought up the, the same kind of complaints that we had uh, prior to obviously uh, what really kicking off for us here in New Zealand and so on was that, you know, our training was insanely unrealistic. The stuff we're doing. Um, after going through uh, having the deployments that I did, um, having the, 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 the time overseas that I did as well, um, and coming home and, you know, uh, at that time overseas, you know, some of the experiences you have and you look at stuff and just go, wow, this doesn't actually work at all. Um, so now we're in a really interesting period, especially, you know, in the communication age um, with, with everything we've got, we have the ability to actually collate um, um, collated a lot of this information. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was around about 2005, there was a uh there was one of the msms or mainstream media outlets they they published a report on tourniquet uh mm -hmm. use of the soft regiments uh over in the states uh which essentially showed how effective uh tourniquet use was and that would have been what gen 6 tq or maybe something like that uh gen 6 cat um and and they went through published that and through just sheer embarrassment, um, obviously, uh, cats essentially overnight became a staple in the US military. Um, e even for us, I mean, when I first joined um, back in the early 2000s, we were told, uh, you know, tourniquet is, you know, you don't use tourniquet and you can't use tourniquet and all the rest of it, you know. Uh, and then overnight, that, that changed very, very rapidly. And that was, it wasn't until like maybe 2008, nine ish I guess, that we started seeing them come into service. So, yeah, um, obviously before that, um, people had heard about tourniquet uh, and we've actually, you know, obviously uh, people have heard about improvising. And that's something that I do want to talk about a little bit because it's something which kind of constantly pops up in courses. You know, people think it's good. You know, uh, you know, everybody thinks they're going to be good to go uh, and capable of doing um, some crazy stuff out there until obviously it goes down. Um, we've got a photo here just for the viewers out there. I just want to warn you before we bring this photo up, viewer discretion is advised. It's quite graphic. Um, and, and this photo, it really kind of struck a chord with me. I've seen it before, but I hadn't seen it for a while. And uh, when, when we kind of brought this on and when we kind of introduced this, I did sit there and I thought about it. And it, it kind of reminded me of a few of the times, or some of the things I've been through as well. It shows the sheer desperation of going mm -hmm. through trying to help somebody. Uh, and this is what you can expect. Now, one thing that I, I do tell my students or I do tell my classes and I let them know out there is that, you know, if, if we fail, if, if people like me, if people like Ed, if people like... Uh, all, all the servicemen and women out there who are, who are going through and doing their thing fail at improvised tourniquet, then how do you think you're going to do? You know, I mean, really, hey, you might get lucky. You might get lucky with it. You know, maybe the tourniquet wasn't actually required that much. Uh, maybe it was, you know, distraction injury with a lot of muscle tissue and not so much in terms of the vascular trauma. But let's have a look at this photo anyway, Ed. And do you want to talk us through maybe uh, the efficacy of uh, improvised TQ if you've got anything there? So, We'll just have a look at this photo real quick first. Um, this is, uh, or do, do you want to give us a bit of a background about this photo? Sorry, I'll, I'll let you talk us through this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, again, the background to this photo that, that I have is, is you know, going through courses. And um, so 
hearing it fifth, sixth, second hand from you know the it being passed down and things like that. But but as you can see, this so this is a, this is a photo, a post mortem photo. This is not this this soldier is not alive anymore, um, unfortunately. And and as you can see, you can see these. There's I, I mean I'm just looking at it right now, and I can see one, two, three. I can see four improvised tourniquets on this on this guy right now. Um, and and this th again, this is this is 04. This is I think a, you know 04 time frame in Iraq, and so this was before the the standard issue of of cat tourniquets to, to every soldier on the battlefield. But you can you can see that that when when gross muscle memory is lost, you know, or when fine muscle skills skills are lost, when you're only going by gross muscle memory, you can see what happens because I. I I was trained at the exact this exact same time in you know the infantry when you can tell that this is infantry 2002 to 2003 2000s early 2000s first aids style you do it once and okay cool for for like expert infantry badge or something like that and then you move on about your day and you're like oh yeah I'm going to be able to do that in in combat when unfortunately as we can see here it's just not going to happen kind of a little bit of the background too is like you know people might ask where was the medic where was the medic well the medic had been either killed or wounded previously um, to this soldier, soldier getting wounded. So, so that it was just, just the, the, the guys in this guy's platoon trying to, trying to save his life. And as you can see, just some of it is just, I mean, I, I can imagine I've, I've, I've been in the situation, not in which this bad, but one of the reasons that I wanted to become a medic after, you know, while I was in the infantry, after my first deployment to Iraq was, you know, I, I'm going out there and there was nothing, no such thing as an, as a standardized IFAC, there was that was it wasn't even a term back then. Again, we weren't issued tourniquets. I was going out with what we called two like Israeli dressings. They're the emergency bandages now, but uh, two Israeli dressings and a, and a canteen pouch, and that was going to save me. And, and ironically, um, and thankfully, it wasn't too bad. But I've had you know so many friends that got wounded that you know you look at them and that that feeling of just complete and utter like horror because you truly don't know what to do in that situation if you haven't been well trained and in medicine or just in assessing a trauma patient or kind of what to think is, is going to hit you. And it has hit me before. And I can imagine that's what was going through the, just the empty feeling was going through these guys, you know, as they worked on, on their, their buddy. And unfortunately it didn't, it didn't do anything. And so it, it's, it's a great reminder and, and a memorial to show that, you know, why, why waste a life when you can spend some money, get a get a you know a, a well-made well-regulated tourniquet that you practice with you know often and use that instead you know yeah 100, 110 percent man um and i think you hit a couple of really really good points here you know really do um first of all training um mm -hmm. you know it's it's all good and there was very much attitude that we had as well i put up a post a while ago on social media um more directed to my friends uh close contacts and so on um, a personal page because you know I'm constantly going on about it on the PracMed Facebook page. This is one of the skills which is definitive on, t and you can be definitive in terms of an outcome. You can go through, you can literally change the, well, you can be the difference between life and death. You mm -hmm. don't need to be a paramedic. You don't need to be a freaking ICP or even you know EMT or whatever the the qualifications are uh, stateside as well. You can literally be an everyday person. And have such a massive cause and effect and tourniquets are an incredibly safe thing um you know you, you look at again that that photo is just pure desperation you know guys going through unfortunately um you know uh you know anybody with any kind of real time uh, in theater has probably experienced something uh in terms of the trauma similar to that and seen the results of either things working or not working so you know i i know the feeling very well uh of of that just pure desperation uh and and really not knowing what to do or knowing where to start you know and that was um for me that was before i joined the military uh being involved in situations unfortunately things didn't work out and stuff like that and um you know that's just something you just need to understand that it doesn't always work out now in terms of tourniquet um let's just talk about uh you know we of course we have improvised tourniquet and i think we've kind of trashed them enough now, enough now and there is there is numerous studies out there um, you know, Google is your friend team. Go out there and, and look at the stuff. There's numerous studies out there uh, which completely debunk the the, the use of tourniquet, uh, sorry, improvised tourniquet with regards to it, particularly uh, anything without a windlass. Um, look, at the end of the day, a cat tourniquet, uh, New Zealand dollars, <laughs> just for American viewers, don't freak out when I say this, um, $665 or around about $65. Uh, for a cat tourniquet, um, obviously from Pratman NZ, you can go ahead and get them. You know that they're genuine. 
because one of the big problems that we're facing at the moment is uh, in New Zealand, I guess stateside as well, um, I've had a ton of these walk through into our courses is fake tourniquets. Oh, yeah. So um, let, let's talk about those real quick. And um, let's, I mean, there's an article that I've written and posted up on the PracMed Facebook page, but let's have a look. So we've got two tourniquets here. Um, uh, I don't know whether you can see that at the moment, Ed, but mm -hmm. we've got one on the uh, left-hand side, which is obviously a real Gen 7 cat tourniquet, and then one on the right, uh, which is your AliExpress uh, knockoff. Now, the problem is um, with these two, uh, well, with the AliExpress ones, is that for people who haven't been trained in them properly, for people who don't understand uh, how important uh, quality materials and quali quality manufacturing processes are, um, the these look very, very, very similar. In fact, they're so similar that there is quite well or quite rep there's a lot of reputable stores in New Zealand who are selling these online uh, as legitimate uh, life-saving uh, devices or interventions for hemorrhage control. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, the easiest way is to go through and check to see whether your cat is real uh, or to make sure that you are getting one from a legit supplier. First of all, uh, all the manufacturer's information should be on the back of the uh, back of the windlass plate. Uh, there's the plastic plate which sits um, on top of the windlass sits on top of it. That's ensuring this is on a cat tourniquet, by the way, uh, ensures that the um, skin and, uh, you know, doesn't get sucked into the uh, windlass itself or into the internal belt strap. Uh, pinching it and tearing it and causing the casualty uh, any undue pain. The other way, obviously, manufacturer's information is obviously printed on the uh, cat tourniquet itself. You can feel it as well with the actual material. I don't know. Have you have you had any experience with the fake cat's head as well? Um, I, I haven't um, like had operational experience with the, with the, the fake ones. I mean, training we we've you know looked at them a couple times, and um, the the biggest like the biggest things that 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 come out of it is that I've seen come out of especially the fake cats um, is um, the the turns of the windlass mm. on the all fake ones it's six seven eight turns and then you now you're turning it into a, a just a glob of of stuff that's attached to skin and pinching skin and all that kind of stuff um, with the the possibility that 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 um, webbing that that um, windlass is attached to is possibly going to break, especially because you've turned it six, seven, eight times. Whereas with a cat, you sh an actual cat, you should be turning that thing two, maybe three times if if you uh, if you need to, um, and you're going to be getting pretty good occlusion. Um, but with those with those fake ones, yeah, that's that's kind of the biggest thing that I've seen when just playing with them. With the one or two <laughs> fake ones that I've played with, was those windlasses took forever to turn, um, even when you've got you know. Um, the proper amount of, of pre-tightening when you do your, your initial Velcro tighten, even when you've got that, it still takes five, six turns. Yeah, that, um, that's a really good point. Obviously, um, I'm, I'm a fan of, you know, going through and uh, having a tourniquet applied uh, just to understand the, the amount of pressure, um, also understanding um, how how painful it can be to a casualty so that you, uh, when, when you understand it, you can go through and obviously you know, uh, anticipate that they might try and may, may try and pull it off. You know, uh, they may try and struggle around, even if they're in a, a lower level consciousness. Um, it's it's never going to be a fun experience. And that's something we're going to talk about in just a second. But just focusing here on the uh, fake cat once again, um, if you look at the tips, the red tips here, that's a characteristic of the um, North American Rescue uh, cat tourniquet. Uh, NARA is obviously the distributor for cat over stateside. Um, you can see on the right hand picture, there's some obvious uh, kind of black dents there. Now that's from heat uh, heat pressing, yeah, uh, heat not the sonic yeah. weld. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a different process that you use. And with regards to the windlass as well, you can see that it's it's slightly different here. The one on the right is more modelled off a uh, Generation Six cat. Um, as opposed to the left hand being a legitimate and real uh, Gen 7. Uh, and I'll show you what the real uh, ones look like in just a minute. But um, yeah, if, if, if you're worried about it, if you're concerned about that, feel free to drop into the um, DMs or the uh, Facebook uh, private messages. Uh, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not trying to make any money about it or anything like that. The way that I look at it is, hey, what if it's me lying out there on the street? What if I'm bleeding to death? What if you've got to drop your corn tail on me? Um, yeah. I don't want these early barber things getting uh, getting put on my leg or anything like that. So, you know, uh, I, I you know, what if it's my partner or my kid or whatever else? You know, it's mm -hmm. it's something that you know I want to get rid of and bring a little bit of truth to the topic. So, yeah, and that's there, um. There definitely uh, have, and one thing that I would like because this is a pretty huge topic is, mm. if, um, 
if if you look if if you find a cat tourniquet on Amazon on eBay, it's fake. Just think of it as fake. That's that's how I go about about it. Um, so if you're like, oh yeah, I found this this on Amazon for you know, I'm gonna go with with uh, with um, um, American dollars, but oh, I found this on you know for 15 bucks, then um, no, it's fake. So the when it comes to the American American side, 27 to 36 dollars is gonna be your 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 spot your sweet spot for a genuine tourniquet, be it cat, be it soft T, be it an RMT, all that kind of stuff. That's kind of where you're going to be going to be seeing, you know, the prices range from. So don't definitely, it's not a, it's not a thing to do to go, you know, cheap is not in your favor when it comes to, when it comes to tourniquets on that one. Yeah. And just, just, um, just talking about that as well. Um, so with regards to tourniquet, um, look, we've got a fat, fake tourniquets out there. Um, there's only two current tourniquets, or there's only two tourniquets which are currently actually authorized by COT Tri C or Council of uh, Tactical Combat Casualty Care. Is that correct? Um, so, well, there's 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 about there's actually about six to nine. I've got to go back and check my numbers. Um, but the soft T wide and the cat are the two. The 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 cat is the one that's issued to every single person in the DoD. Um, soft T wide, or it's, yeah, and the soft th those are kind of the the two that are. Very much those scored the highest in all of the the Cote Tri C um, tests mm -hmm. and um, studies that that were done. Um, recommended. So, that's the one. The yeah. Highest recommended from the Cote Tri C. That's that's what we'll we'll, we'll go with. Those are those are the highest recommended. I've never personally even worked with anything other than those two. I just have not even tried because it's just they're both of those. You're going to get the 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 outcome that you want. You know, with, with either of those. Yeah, yeah. So the, the the soft is kind of far more uh, TACMED Solutions US um, has obviously designed, developed and gone through a few iterations of the uh, soft tourniquet. Um, I was quite a fan of the thing, just purely down to simplicity when it first came out. However, um, for civilian use, um, and, and I've got no operational experience with a soft, uh, soft tourniquet or soft wide tourniquet, um, but it's something that kind of sparked my interest again when you brought it back up because I hadn't looked at it again um, for quite some time when it had the little screw tap on it. I just didn't kind of really get behind that for, you know, general everyday civilian use. It was just something which, again, if we refer back to those fine motor skills, was probably going to be just a step too far um, for most people. But we've gone through, we've had a look at it. Um, you've kind of, you've gained my interest again with regards to the soft tourniquet. And we, here we have one here. Um, this is the soft uh, four, which is well, soft four wide or soft wide generation four, sorry, um, <laughs> which is the one which is recommended by uh, COT Tri C. Um, and what's got me really interested about this one, um, there's actually two aspects to it. And I'm going to let you kind of take the reins on this just after I get through these, Ed, um, because, you know, I don't have any operational experience with this thing. There's two things. First of all, um, simplicity and size. So if you look at the size of this, uh, especially when you compare it, and I'm holding them side by side there. Compared to a cat tourniquet, um, the soft is definitely a lot smaller uh, in terms of its profile, um, both sideways and, of course, uh, widthways as well. It's well, kind of similarish, I guess. Um, but yeah, you can flat fold this down. Uh, we can flat fold the soft down quite a bit more. The second thing, um, and I kind of mentioned it before, with regards to application, oh my gosh, like uh, anybody out there who's had a tourniquet properly applied to a limb, uh, if you have, it is seriously not a comfortable thing. The soft, though, uh, from an anecdotal perspective, uh, just from mine, uh, a lot more comfortable to have placed over a limb, both leg and arm, both upper and lower. Um, so that was probably something which I noticed. That was probably the really big difference between the two. Um, have you got anything else to add about the soft or the cat or anything else like that? Yeah, I mean, and they, they did a great job, especially with the, with the soft T one. Um, so let me let me paraphrase right now with Co-T Tri-C, the, the first-gen soft, Turn it, you know, the soft T tourniquet before the generation wide when it was just a one inch band, which is probably the one that you're that you know of, like less yep. than an inch or about an inch band, and had the screw tip. That is completely not authorized anymore. They've they've done away with that, and um, because they were finding because it was so skinny, they were finding that um, there were a lot of a, a lot of uh, um, end operator like neurovascular issues, things like that. It was actually crushing nerves and things like that. So so they wanted to kind of um, they they did knock that off the books of the coach each see and but but you know again. Credit where credits due. Tag Med Solutions came back, you know, just like just like North American does, and they're always continually um, evolving their their process and, and making things better. And and they did, they, I think they did a great job with with the Softy Wide. When the Softy Wide came out, that was definitely one turned into my go-to tourniquet when I when I was deploying, um, just for you know 
reasons that you know we can we can discuss if you want to discuss now but that that kind of turned to my i still had cats that you know i would use and guys would still have cats i still know how to use cats but that was kind of my that kind of turned into my my one that i liked yeah sure um i've, I've almost always kind of uh favored the cat um pr probably because you know that's what we got issued um that's what we got sent forth with um i have never seen a cat fail except from user error and when i say user error uh we did touch on this very briefly before uh getting that first as as i refer to it high and tight strong first bite um with regards to that first bite what we're talking about there is making sure that we get the tourniquet um initial uh that the strap initially tighten properly so that we can actually achieve that mechanical advantage um for those of you not too sure about what i'm talking about i'll give you a, i'll give you a demonstration here we've got a uh blue training cat so what we're talking about here is that if we go ahead uh slip the cat tourniquet up over a limb if we don't get the good strong fight first bite on okay then there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to tighten the wind lass uh and achieve occlusion as we mentioned before of the actual limb okay so that, that's really important the only time i've seen one of these fail uh when somebody had the aggression of a wet tea towel with regards to actually going through putting it onto the limb uh and the uh windlass simply could not achieve mechanical advantage but um you obviously have got your reasons for not uh kind of getting in behind the cat as much as the soft or there's a reason why you change now i'm not kind of uh, trying to push uh either brand here too hard or anything else like that but i think it's very important for people to understand because it kind of uh is, is an important thing for later on down the line with regards to obviously um a storage management carrying and all that kind of stuff we'll talk about that soon um uh what what, what problems have you encountered or what problems have you seen with uh either or the nuances um, and I mean, this is, yeah, this, these are just kind of literal, like one can be better. This one has good points. This one has bad points. Um, now I have, I, I wouldn't say it wasn't a catastrophic, catastrophic failure on a, on a cat, but I have a cat, a cat that, that didn't, didn't, um, a Velcro as well as it, as I was wanting it to, as well as I was feeling it should have. Um, it was, it was in the desert, lots of, lots of sweat, lots of, uh, lots of blood and lots of sand didn't really go too well with the, with the Velcro. So um, I took a, I, ironically, another cat to use it, but it took me two tourniquets to, to, you know, stop a bleed on a leg. Again, is that, was it, was it a problem? It was easily amenable. It was easily, you know, solved. Not too big of a deal. I had, you know, two is one, one is none type thing. Always have more than you need. Don't let that one thing, that one single point of failure be the thing that wrecks your day. But, um, that, that, that first, that first one did, you know, didn't provide the, um, the, um, full clamping down ability that I really wanted it to at the time. And it was that that thing got immediately dirty. Um, that tourniquet when I was putting on this, this patient, there was, there was a lot of, um, I don't want to say patient aggression, but the patient wasn't as, as, you know, um, easy to, to be able to get the tourniquet on an initial lap patients. So there's a lot of writhing around all that kind of stuff. And the tourniquet got dirty, yada, yada, yada. It happens. Um, but again, um, that is the only thing that I've ever seen again, guys that I've talked to, um, you know, good friends of mine never had problems. And again, you have that one, you know, Murphy time Murphy shows up. That's why you have another one. And so again, I've used cats before many times before that, and they were, they were great. So I, I, I definitely do not want to turn people off to, to the cat or, you know, any of that stuff. He's, he's <laughs> these are the tickets that, um, that, that our co tri C approved, uh, at the top of the list. And I, I definitely do want to, uh, reiterate that because they do their jobs very very well and they do work very very well yeah um and I, I i guess that's something um you know i haven't considered because simply i haven't encountered it and i think it's really important to look at and learn from other people's experiences um you're you know it's it's foolish to ignore that kind of stuff you know uh if there's any kind of weight behind it uh, yeah sure and and the point that you bring up as well and this is something which i've brought up a lot uh, in terms of people going through and going, oh yeah, you know, um, you know, and just just place the tourniquet around the arm or the leg. Uh, when people lose limbs or when people are, you know, really badly injured, they don't just sit there and just kick back and relax, man. Um, well, some, I mean, some people do in a real bad way, but um, you know, it, it's it's one of these things that you know you've you, you know operability of the thing. You know, you can expect to get through the mud. You can expect to have these things happen. And just holding up this one here, the soft, you can see here, it's got this um, kind of little textured kind of backing on it um, that helps obviously hold it in place uh, against sweaty, dirty, 
bloody skin, it's probably not going to do too much in that sense, but definitely against clothing uh, mm -hmm. if you're in that tactical setting. Uh, and you can see that there's no Velcro uh, anywhere. This is just a single loop band uh, which goes all the way through. Uh, and that's one of the things, and that's how it achieves obviously it's super flat fold as opposed to the cat, which has uh, got two belts, one external, one internal, and there's Velcro the kind of whole way through. Um, so that could be a problem, and that kind of really pricked my ears up. So um, yeah, definitely thank, thank you for bringing that kind of about it. And I think it's about, you know, finding the right solution uh, for the right thing. One of the things I have found, and I don't know whether this is just my lack of um, lack of experience with the soft tourniquet, um, th one of the things I still think the cat absolutely hoses down on uh, is definitely uh, if you have to apply it with yourself. Now, there's a few people probably listening who are going, oh, yeah, but how many times has anybody had to do that? I think it's uh it's 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 a good feature to have i think that you know never say never um does it happen a lot no not really uh, one-handed application i don't know how many uh times I, I i certainly have never seen it myself uh except yeah. obviously in training but it's just uh one of those things whereas the soft was quite a lot more difficult to apply one-handed i had to uh find that i had to either roll onto the ground uh to hold the belt still or the, the windlass still or go through uh lean up against the wall and get it done obviously if you're applying it to a leg no problems whatsoever uh, and again, uh, certainly from my anecdotal perspective, a lot more comfortable to apply uh, the uh, soft tourniquet than it was for the cat. So we've gone through, we've covered the cat, we've covered the soft. Um, I'm not going to bother with the rest. I think there's no point in reinventing the wheel. I think those two keep things really well covered. Um, no, I'm not going to entertain the topic of uh, rats tourniquet. <laughs> It's uh, just, <laughs> let's not go down that route. <laughs> okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about when to use tourniquets. And I think this is something, um, again, we're going to keep this quite short and to the point um, so we don't blow out too far. But I think it's really, really important to cover this. Um, the reason why I say this is because uh, for those, you know, uh, for, for, for those of us who haven't seen much trauma, um, you know, when you first see somebody with, a really bad uh, injury to a limb, it can be quite distracting. Uh, and when I say a really bad injury, um, what I mean by that is a lot of uh, tissue trauma with regards to the skin and muscle uh, and potentially bone as well. But it won't always mean that there's always going to be an associated uh, heavy bleed or, or a massive hemorrhage associated with that. And um, one of the counter arguments against tourniquet use is obviously oh you didn't need to put the tourniquet on i i completely refute that i think that's an absolutely failed mindset um i believe that if there's any doubt there is no doubt whatsoever so let's talk a little bit now uh about um when you should or when you shouldn't use a tourniquet what what's your what's your thoughts about that ed yeah i mean um if you it, when, when you come to come to think of it there are you know um the recommendations are always going to be um, in the presence of life-threatening hemorrhage um, of an extremity, always it doesn't, it doesn't we don't care about venous, arterial, anything like that. Presence of what looks like life-threatening hemorrhage, then then put it, you'll, you'll never go wrong by putting a tourniquet on. Um, if you're if you're in a tactical situation, um, high and tight while you're in care under fire, um, mm -hmm. get away from from that that zone that 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 X as we call it um, in, in our line of work. I don't know how what you guys refer to, refer to it, but there's a reason that guy. That person fell there. You might want to get out of that area. So if you can, if you can safely do it and carry under fire, high and tight, and then and then uh, move out of the out of the kill zone, and then then begin uh, during your tactical field care to to reassess and see if you can um, move that tourniquet. Um, when it comes to leads that might not be um, or, or wounds, should I say wounds that might not be needing a tourniquet, I, I usually kind of think of the um, like if it's a uh, um, complex um, uh, fracture that, that has, you know, is, is coming out of the skin, things like that. Not all of those involve vasculature. Not all of those involve the arteries, not all of those invi involve the veins. So, so there, there, there might, you, you, you could probably take a wait and see attitude a little bit to that, to see if there's there, there t that uh, some, some large amount of hemorrhage comes out um, with that. But if when in doubt, if there's large hemorrhage on an extremity, use a tourniquet. No one will ever really, fault you for using a tourniquet if you know if if you if if you do it on, on in in the heat of the moment um especially with when you're when you're thinking about civilian and military sectors um tourniquets can stay on for for up to two hours for the most part and that's kind of the you know two to three hours three hours is really playing with it but up to two hours if there's any place in you know auckland or new zealand all that kind of stuff in which 
evacuation is going to turn it into two hours, which there might be, but 95% of the time, probably not. Um, I know, I know there are more, more sheep there than, than humans. So I do know it's a little bit more remote than, than, than it is in the States, but, but even in doubt, EMS is probably going to be there with enough time to where they can assess that patient, make their, their uh, decision on what they want to do. Or even once they get to the, to the emergency room, they can make their decision. So again, when in doubt, always, you know, don't, don't be hesitant with a tourniquet um, because again, seconds are time in this, but mm -hmm. if you've got a, a compound fracture some sort of external fracture that, um, doesn't really look like it's bleeding too badly, have it on standby, but it, it's probably, you know, the possibility of it, you know, needing the use is, is probably going to, you know, go down from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we obviously teach uh, within our class. Um, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, drop a whole stop and bleed thing here or anything like that, uh, you know, which we include in every single uh, one of our courses uh, because it's, it's such an important topic, which you can have so much outcome or, or uh, so much impact on the outcome with. Um, but we, we go anything about the ankle and yeah, if there's any doubt, there's no doubt whatsoever. Just get that, get that thing on. Yeah, and I think, always, uh, if it's amputations or partial amputations, right on just do it if, if you've got one of the, if you've got an amputation or partial amputation that's always going to be an indication for a tourniquet don't even doubt yourself on that go straight to a tourniquet it's an interesting point you bring up about the fractures as well um seen a few really nasty ones especially tib fib uh fractures where you have uh obviously uh compound and the bone is sticking through the skin and and in some cases you know the foot is folded right up against the heel is pretty much folded up against the calf mm -hmm. but when you at the actual uh, colouring of the tissue and so on, uh, when you look at the actual bleed, there is certainly still uh, circulation going through. And you can check, of course, on the pedal pulse or through uh, cap refill of the of the toes. And it's quite extraordinary um, how much trauma there can be uh, sometimes and no major bleed. So what we're talking about here, um, or I think one of the key points uh, to really kind of hammer home here is, you know, just take that deep breath, slow down, know what you're looking at. Um, if, if, if you're in the tactical environment, hell, you know, you, your priority is not going to be sitting there uh, mucking around with a tourniquet, just put one on. But if it's in a civilian environment or industrial environment, you have time, you know, uh, let's get down to skin. Let's make sure we've got the tourniquet above the highest injury point. Uh, let's make sure that we get it on properly. You know, just calm down, go through and do your thing. And the best way to do that is train, um, train, train, train. Don't stop, you know. What does it take 10, 15 minutes every fortnight to go through rehash drills? Go through, bang one on, uh, get it done. You know, uh, a lot of people sit there and they think they're good to go. Uh, we have a few drills. We have a few ways of um, kind of exposing that, and it's not to it's not to humiliate people. It's to kind of bring them uh, or bring the reality of the situation. Then go through and we build them up. And when they leave uh, our courses, um, they're all over it like a rash. So yeah, that's really 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 good. So um, when we when we look at uh, obviously the uh, application, uh, we've kind of covered that with regards to the T tri C um, and and whatnot. Um, that's a whole other topic. And again, I think I think we're gonna have to bring it back at some stage man um you know and, and kind of kind of uh get get a little more into detail for especially those uh military out there it's amazing how quick uh, almost now can disappear um let's talk real quick uh about the storage preparation um and whatnot from a military point of view in particular and, and a civilian as well um this is something which really really bothers me uh and if there's any police who are listening out there right now um, in the last fortnight, I have had interactions with a number of police. Uh, no, I haven't been in cuffs. <laughs> um, but going through, and I've talked to a number of police who have been out there, and uh, what's, what I've noticed is that you guys are keeping them in side of the plastic wrapper. Uh, and what I mean by this is there's you know, obviously the cat tourniquet okay, and the soft as well comes inside of a plastic wrapper. Now, I just want to hammer this home. That does not keep your tourniquet sterile. It doesn't keep it clean. It's simply there to show you it's an OEM, it's uh, original equipment manufactured product. It's simply there to show you that it's got the instruction manual inside of it. Um, you need to take it out of there. Um, and th we put a video up on the Facebook, on the on the Instagram the other day, uh, of somebody getting uh, simulated blood covered in their hands and, and going through and trying to open that TQ. Believe me, when you're under stress, when you're under pressure, when you're sitting there losing those fine motor skills, uh, when the heat's on, when people are screaming and, and you've got all hell breaking loose, that those seconds are precious. They are really precious. And it's going to feel like a lifetime and eternity. Please, if you're out there, if you're listening to this and you're a cop, please rip that tourniquet out of that little plastic pack, put it back into your pouch, okay, and just make sure that you maintain your tourniquet. Um, we, again, on the PracMed uh, Facebook and soon to be launched brand new website, we have the instructions of care on there. So, um, Ed, uh, 
after my little diatribe there to the New Zealand police about their cat issue, let's go through and let's talk a little bit about um, about the cat tourniquet, um, you know, in terms of storage, in terms of placement. Um, what have you found has worked? What have you found has not worked uh, with regards to, uh, uh, from a tactical perspective on, on the body or, or any kind of perspective? So, I mean, on, on our end, on the tactical side, um, definitely um, definitely getting out of that wrapper. Um, there are a few there are a few little things that, that um, end up, you know, rearing their heads once you take out of that wrapper and you're storing it in the open and things like that where we were because um, for us, and, and I don't know how it is on, on you guys' end, um, but we, we'd store, right, I, I would store, you know, three or four right on the chest of my kit tied with rubber bands, half loop with double with rubber bands that I can just pull off really fast, start working um, if I needed to. And I kept it in the center of my chest so that if I had to reach, if I lost the, the, the functionality of one, of one arm that I'd be able to, to move to different to different hands and, and be able to grab it so i'm not coming over this way or coming over this mm -hmm. way for a tourniquet um i did the same thing on my on my m9 bag i would have just a string of tourniquets all the way down the sides of my my m9 bag and on the back just tied with with rubber bands um and usually i would go again this is this is desert you know temperatures desert sand desert conditions out in the on the you know um the elements i would go about every you know three months and just, you know, every month I'd, I'd check, but then usually about every three to four months, I would, I'd be taking those things and tossing them. Those would turn into trainers for the, for the local nationals or something like that. And then I would, I would put in new tourniquets again, because a lot of these, again, you know, you've got the Velcro with the cat and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that, you know, can degrade over time. So it's just something that you, you know, you need to know. I would just throw it, it would turn into a trainer. Um, I'd spray paint it orange or spray paint it some shiny color. It would turn into the tra trainer for the local nationals. And that's what we would use. Um, on that end, and then just kind of you know recycle them and get new ones in, and and uh, and use those for for the guys. So that's that's kind of how I mitigated that. But that's how I would always carry them. I always wanted them just right there. I could just rip it off of a off of a rubber band. The, the rubber band would rip. I wouldn't have to be fumbling with any type of like you know thing to get it out or anything like that. I could just rip it off. The guys would use rubber bands on their kits. Um, when it comes to when it comes to the the guys on the teams. Uh, Placements, again, doctrine is always put it in the same place. Um, when you're working with a bunch of type A personalities that like to do what, the, what they want to do, um, it just turns into the medic having to, to memorize where every spot, every every guy keeps their tourniquet eventually. Um, we we as an SOP would usually go with an IFAC on, on our pocket up here. Um, and I would know, everybody would know to move that out of the way if we had to place a tourniquet or anything like that. And we kept a tourniquet in there. That's 95% of the time where guys would keep them. And those were usually theirs. I would usually, if I ever were to have to use it in, in a situation for somebody else, I was always usually pulling them off myself, pulling them off of my, um, my rock and then restocking them back onto myself. Like, you know, as I, as I needed all that kind of stuff, but I, I knew where every guy's was um, and how they stored it and everything like that. If they stored it on their, on their chest, if they stored it up here on, on their off, on their off shoulder, things like that, I knew where it was and I could easily get to it and, and access it for them and, and use it if they needed it. Yeah, that's um, that's a that's a really interesting thing. I think um, you know, uh, yeah, for for the, for the Type A personalities out there, for for all the the so called alphas and whatnot, um, you know, I think I think this is this is one thing which is just uh, I believe non negotiable. Check the ego, figure out a spot to put that TQ yeah. in, uh, and just just make it make it across the board um and that's really really important everybody needs to know where it's at um for all the young hitters out there i tell you what this is something that i um unfortunately from hindsight um i i wish that uh i had had enforced uh within the teams and groups that i work with and so on uh was making sure that we had uh our tourniquet or our med systems in one spot and they were all uniformed um, uh, uh, something that you need to think about as well, especially for the tactical aspect, uh, is that you, you need to remember that this is not for other people. This is for you. Um, so going through, and if you have that uniformity, that is going to pay off so big, uh, big time uh, if, if things go down. And again, um, you know, uh, everybody can squeeze a trigger. Everybody can get out there and flex the old index. But when it comes to the med side of the house, um, you know, uh, especially during the peace time, a lot of people don't think about this. You know, a lot of people are sitting there going, oh, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe I don't need to carry this because it's a little bit, you know, if I can reduce my, my kit by 350 grams, you know, it's going to make me even faster. 
yeah, no, nah, there's you know, trauma doesn't discriminate, man. So make make sure that that stuff's there. Just in terms of the storage as well, um, obviously we make our own products here in New Zealand. Uh, we have them made by uh, one of our local manufacturers. Shout out to Saber Tactical. If you don't follow them, make sure you do on the gram uh, and of course on the Facebook as well. Veteran owned and operated company, and we make our pouches here in NZ. One of the things that we've gone through and done with them uh, for all of our stuff is basically made the tourniquets. Uh, so they are actually sheltered inside um, because unless you are, uh, unless you do have a blank check, you don't want to be replacing the cat every three months. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Just throw it laughs> out. If, if you know, um, you got to know that operational environment. So if you if you don't want to be replacing cats, yeah. then definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you can if you really want to. Um, these these things will last literally a lifetime as long as you keep them stored properly and maintain them. Uh, don't abuse them, and, and part of that's keeping them out of the sunlight, um, whatnot. Now. Different operational requirements are going to, you know, uh, dictate how you need to have them set up and uh, kind of placed and whatnot. But yeah, it is what it is. So I, th I think that's really, really, um, that's a really, really good thing there Ed, as well uh, in terms of the um, in terms of the placement. And I'm sure we can dive uh, really deep into the uh, tactical side of the house uh, uh, on another on another interview or another Facebook live um, as we're doing now. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I guess um, well, from the civilian aspect as well, um, you know, we, we've kind of talked a little bit about the military side of the house um, for, for civilian aspect and stuff like that. Look, hemorrhage control is no less dangerous. Um, I think that people need to be aware that uh, if you are going to have uh, first aid kits, which typically get rummaged through raided and work sites and stuff like that for plasters or bandages and whatnot, it's really important to understand there is a big difference between first aid and trauma or in particular hemorrhage control. Um, I never mix the two up um, or, or, you know, in my main med bag uh, or nine bag, as you call them in, um, you know, we, we go through, I do have a pouch inside uh, for first aid products uh, or first aid stuff right down the bottom. It's still easy to access and stuff like that, but it's right down the bottom and out of the way. Um, everything I do is prioritized uh, in a sense and Hemcon is definitely there. You've got to make sure that you do uh, have your tourniquet available, uh, differentiate between the two. And, and a bit of a change in mindset uh, and culture as well is pretty important. So uh, these things, you know, again, they do save lives. I think training properly with them and understanding that is very, very important. Um, but yeah, just making sure if we do have these things in the workplace, we do check on them. Uh, we do make sure that people haven't borrowed them or whatever else, and there is accountability in that sense. Um, but we can't be locking stuff up because, you know, again, when it comes to the crunch, those, that minute or two that it takes to get that um uh that that uh tourniquet out may be the difference between somebody making it and not making it mm -hmm. um okay so um that is pretty much all we have for today um i've just gone through um we i'm just having a look at the questions here um there's been a few comments that we've had come through obviously um you know people have uh, jumped on board and, and i'd just like to thank everybody who has come on board um, we've, we've got people who have purchased uh, AliExpress tourniquets out there um, and, you know, through through the education that we're providing, uh, through the regular posts that we're dropping and stuff like that, I think there's a lot of people who have been kind of going, hey, maybe maybe this is something that, you know, I should have a look at, realise this stuff is counterfeit and it has saved, uh, potentially saved lives. For us, we're a big fan of going through uh, and making sure that we do keep on top of the uh, kind of the, the the anecdotes or the the, uh, the stuff that we get provided. And so far, um, you know, we've been very, very successful in terms of people saving people's lives. We've had a number of cats deployed, um, surfing incidents and accidents, um, and even uh, for self-harm incidents. Um, these things are all real. Um, and and it is what it is. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been absolutely fantastic to be able to provide that. Just as a bit of a heads up, team, Crack Med NZ now stocks the Soft Wide Gen Four and of course the Cat Tourniquet. So if you're looking for a tourniquet, if you're looking for a real one, you know where to head to www.crackmednz.com um, and pick yourself up one. Um, thank you very much there, Dean. It's good to see you on board. Uh, another ex-medic, uh, he did some time uh, on the helicopters here and did some time overseas and stuff like that. Absolute legend. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on board, Ed. We don't have any questions, which is very, very unusual. Typically we do, um, but I think uh, maybe today it was a little bit quick. Team, if you do have any questions about the tourniquets, please uh, go ahead fire us a DM, uh, fire us a PM, uh, drop into the, the inbox there. Um, I'll get back to you as quick as we can. We will be doing another Facebook Live next month. Um, we'll talk about another topic. Um, and, yeah, that will be soon to be released. 
But from myself, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Ed, uh, from the team here at Prac Media NZ, thank you so much for coming on board uh, and, and delivering uh, or imparting your skills and knowledge through to us. This will be made available when the new website drops. So stand by for that. We've got some amazing or some really big announcements to come with that as well. So, yeah, stand by for that. And, um, yeah, thank you. Is there anything that you want to bring up, any key final points yet before we, uh, before we get on with the rest of our afternoon and day? No, I mean, no, we, I, as, as much as you try to, to cover, you know, in an hour, the, I, think we, I think we hit at least the, the major points. Um, you know, it's, it's, definitely a, it's definitely a topic that can, that can go into a hole. So uh, there might have to be a part two or part three that we can uh, keep going on about, uh, about the intricacies of, of tourniquets because it does kind of get interesting after a while. <laughs> um, uh, I've, or I've already been kind of thinking about it a little bit. And for those of you who are still listening, obviously, um, you know, I'll, I'll never go outside of my scope. I'll never go outside of what I know. So we have some incredible talent here at PracMed NZ. Uh, in fact, a lot of my trainers, in fact, most of my trainers make my CV look pretty mediocre, uh, to be completely honest, which is awesome. You know, uh, I couldn't I couldn't wish for anything better. You know, instead of uh, sitting there pulling on the reins, it's always good to be, you know, or sorry, trying to kick people out the bum, it's always good to be pulling on the reins. So um, probably uh, in the future, I won't exactly, uh, I won't set it up for when, but we'll get we'll get one of our, one or two of our trainers on board and we can all sit down around the fire and uh, have a bit of a chat and I'll let you guys go for it. And maybe you guys can, um, I don't know, uh, select a topic or whatever else and, Kind of uh, start hitting that. Um, an hour is not a long time. Uh, it's been amazing. Uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, and I uh, know a few people feel a little awkward about it, but thank you for your service as well. Um, you know, uh, you know as well as I do. You know, there are some really, really bad people out there. Um, and you know, there's only there's only uh, one way that can be managed. Um, so yeah, thank you for your service, uh, and thank you for bringing some of the positive things for your service through to the civilian community, uh, namely here in New Zealand tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on board, Ed, uh, and I'm sure we'll catch up again in the future. Yeah, thanks for having me, Simon. It was great. Absolutely epic. Cheers, mate. Everybody stay safe out there, but stay ready. Semper paratas. Always ready. Cheers, team. Have a good day. <laughs>